Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the War for Badab, where things are swiftly accelerating out of control. With the destruction of the Tithe fleet, Tarnit Koenig and the Lords of the Cartago sector's biggest gamble to date failed miserably and cost the lives of tens of thousands of Imperial servants, along with Adeptus Mechanicus representatives and Administratum officials. The Mechanicus immediately moved to lodge complaints both with the High Lords and the upper echelons of their own command structure, demanding that the warders be censored. The Administratum, however, for the time being backed down and redoubled their claims against the Cartago sector, demanding that they deliver the resources that the Administratum was owed, caring not where they might get them from. This in turn forced Tarnit Koenig and the Lords of Cartago to begin looking for alternative sources of income. First, they began by expanding their own trade routes, trying to circumvent the warders and imposing their tithes and tariffs upon the neighbouring systems, rather than the autonomous zone under the command of the tyrant. This would, however, only produce a pittance of the total tithe owed by the Cartago sector, and what little could be gained would be done so at a much, much higher risk. The pale stars made the autonomous zone look downright pink and fluffy by comparison. It was never going to be anywhere near enough to make up for the shortfall and so other, more drastic measures would have to be taken. The Lords of the Cartago Sector, with Tarnit Koenig at the head, initiated an intensive campaign against the Autonomous Zone and the Tyrant of Badab. They claimed moral corruption, treachery and vainglorious pride on behalf of Lufthuron and lobbied ever more zealously for official action to be taken against the Warders. And it began to show results, with the Adeptus Mechanicus aligning themselves with the Cartago Sector, and with the local Administratum Assaia Generals also beginning to come around, possibly via some promises of increased percentages once the wealth started flowing again, the impetus upon the High Lords to finally act was growing day by day, but Huron was not going to wait for his quote-unquote day in court before taking action. In 903, a mere two years after the destruction of the Tithe fleet, he signed the Articles of Just Secession taking the Maelstrom-adjacent Autonomous Zone officially and completely out of the Imperium. This was the single most drastic course of action the Tyrant could have ever chosen to pursue, and he did it because of the quote, many and grievous insults, presumptions and denials of the Emperor given rights and titles of the Adeptus Astartes by the false and wayward servants of the Administratum, the Carthan Lords and their allies, End quote. With this declaration, Lufthuron had unilaterally rejected and denied all tithe requests all obligations, all duties, and all fealty to any and all imperial authority. But he also reaffirmed that the Maelstrom Warders would continue to act as a shield for the Imperium. This was not a renunciation of the God Emperor or the authority inherent in Terra and the Golden Throne. It was, however, a renunciation of all administratum authority. The Warders would continue to protect the Autonomous Zone to the best of their possibility, and by so doing would in turn protect the Imperium, but they would not give up any further resources, since now the defense of the Autonomous Zone was their one singular purpose, and no other debt to the Imperium was recognized to exist. 
And as a final thorn, the document also demanded a full-scale investigation into the Cartago sector and its ruling class to determine to what degree and extent they were culpable for this secession of sorts, and whether or not the Lords of Cartago even actually did have a claim to the Cartago sector at all. This was by many viewed as a sort of threatening olive branch. The tyrant of Bedab saying, we will leave the Imperium, but if someone somewhere finds the Lords of Cartago to be at fault for all of this, and maybe offered up some segments of space which they certainly did not have a historical claim to, then maybe we have all been a little bit rash in our decisions. And on the off chance that an amicable accord could not be reached, there was also a none too subtle dagger hidden beneath the olive branch. As almost simultaneously with the signing of the degree, Imperial shipping lanes passing near the Autonomous Zone began reporting increased activity by, quote, unknown and unidentified raiders. I think it bears repeating at this point that no pirates, marauders, or raiders of any sort had been able to cross through the Autonomous Zone for decades. Due to the Tyrant's extensive slash and burn strategy, along with the ever increasing amount of defences surrounding the Autonomous Zone, the construction of which only accelerated with the declaration of the Just Articles of Secession, Many would even argue that it was logistically impossible for raiders that originated from within the storm to reach the outer edges of the Autonomous Zone, much less Imperial space beyond that. The implications were very blatant indeed, that these new raiders of an unidentified and unknown origin hailed from considerably closer to home than the Maelstrom Warp Storm Zone. The Lords of Cartago, perhaps not yet quite realizing the problem they had at their hands, responded by increasing the patrols near the border zone and assigning further escort vessels to their trade missions. This did nothing to slow the bleed. And far worse was yet to come. Initially, they were simply losing contact with merchant vessels, trade ships, small tithe shipments, and the occasional series of picket vessels. But then, they began to lose control of entire planets. Any doubt that this was far more than scattered marauders or raiders out of the warp storm were put fully to rest when a single badly garbled and broken up transmission seemed to suggest that one of these worlds had been placed under siege by space marine forces. I can only imagine the cold shiver that must have run down Tarnit Koenig's spine as she realized just what she had been antagonizing this whole time. In a mere matter of months, the Cartago sector, which had remained essentially inviolate for millennia, was turned on its head. It began losing ships at a horrifying rate, and entire planets would simply just seize communications. Mere days ago, Tarnit Koenig's worst fears were the Assayer General and the tithes they claimed Cartago owed to the Imperium. That fear suddenly seemed awfully distant and inconsequential compared to the creeping violence now encroaching upon her borders. But once the shock began to subside, and other people may have broken or begged for mercy, 
She did not. For all her failings, Tarnit Koenig was a tough woman. Born to rule and raised to do it well, she would not surrender to some fringe barbarians, no matter their military potential. There were still means at her disposal. First and foremost, this was clearly evidence of aggression on behalf of the warders, and it was all sent off to the High Lords with demands of military action. The Departmento Monitorum, the Adeptus Administratum, and the Adeptus Mechanicus had to pledge military support to the Cartago sector for a counter-attack into the Autonomous Zone to re-establish Imperial authority. And I have no doubt it was an impassionate plea, well couched and eloquently delivered. Surely, she must have reasoned, there is simply no way the High Lords would accept this. The secession of the resource grid could not possibly be allowed to go unchallenged. The resources, the manufacturing capacity, the billions of Imperial citizens. Surely the High Lords, the Muritorum, the Administratum and the Mechanicus could not let that go. But for all her thoroughly admirable backbone, Tarnit Koenig still did not understand what she was fighting. Oh sure, she'd heard the stories, certainly. The God Emperor's avenging angels, the superhuman warriors against which no enemy could stand. She'd heard them, and undoubtedly dismissed them as nothing more than fanciful fairy tales told to an ignorant populace to keep them placid and happy in the supposed security of their superhuman guardians out there in the stars. But reality, of course, is cruel and oh so different from the fairy tales. Had these supposedly undefeatable warriors managed to keep the Autonomous Zone safe? No, they were even now stealing her wealth to build their own defences. The Tyrant had 3,000 warriors at most, and a few hundred thousand militia that he called his Tyrant's Guard. Cartago was an imperial sector, with imperial guard regiments, a battle fleet, and the capacity to raise millions of men. What possible threat could some backwater province be to her? And with the aid of the Imperium, by the Administratum, the Munitorum, the Mechanicus behind her, it would be a simple policing action to crush these rebels and resume business as usual. A return, finally, to normality. But those she was asking for help they knew. They know what a space marine is. They know what the Adeptus Astartes are. And most importantly of all, they know how apt the title of the God Emperor's Avenging Angels is. And the Lords of Old Earth were not in a hurry to make them their enemies just yet. They dispatched a reply to Tarnith Koenig, informing her that the dispute between the Cartago sector and the Maelstrom adjacent resource extraction grid over tithes customarily sent from the Maelstrom adjacent resource extraction grid to the Cartago sector is considered to be an internal dispute, and therefore none of the Imperium's business. The fact is that at any point in time, there are many, possibly hundreds, maybe even thousands of internal disputes going on inside of the Imperium at any given time. Many of them are legalistic, cordial, diplomatic, as this conflict was, but many of them are also bloody and violent in the extreme, 
Entire wars of conquest have and are being fought well within the Imperium's borders between loyal Imperial subjects. And as a general rule, as long as these conflicts do not overly impact the Imperium's tithes, Terra does not care. Terra is not interested in micromanaging every planet, every local affair, every dispute, even wars frankly are rather piddly concerns when compared to the business of running an entire galaxy. And frankly, cynical though it may sound, neutrality has its benefits. If two equally loyal Imperial subjects are engaged in the business of murdering one another, then regardless of which side ends up victorious, the consequences to the wider Imperium are minuscule if any. The benefits to picking a side are virtually non-existent. The Imperium would have to deploy its valuable military resources and fighting men to settle internal disputes instead of fighting orc wags, chaos crusades, or tyrannid hive fleets. It would be like killing a spider with a flamethrower, only to inevitably end up burning down your own house. And in this particular instance, the spider's wearing power armor and is armed with a rocket propelled grenade launcher. Nay, better to let the children settle their own quarrels, and that was exactly what was going to happen next. Disappointed, but probably not surprised by the refusal of aid, Tarnit Koenig set about readying her sector for war. Increasing the numbers of the PDF, giving them extra training, pilfering some Imperial Guard supplies and armament in all due likelihood, and most importantly of all, readying Battlefleet Cartago for full-scale deployment. And this was a fleet best not underestimated. Cartago had made it its business to escort some of the most valuable cargo in the Imperium through some of the most dangerous trade lanes in the Imperium for thousands of years. Battlefleet Cartago was seasoned and hardened by lengthy patrol duty and well equipped boasting several cruiser-class vessels along with plentiful escorts, they could pose a realistic threat to most Space Marine fleets. Battlefleet Cartago absolutely could, potentially, contest the warders in the void, but on the ground it was an entirely different story. There are very, very few forces within the galaxy, never mind the Imperium, that could credibly oppose the Adeptus Astartes in a ground war, and the poorly trained, mostly PDF militia forces of Cartago was not one of them. Even pitting an entire regiment of Cartago troops against a single Astral Claw would be like locking a diminutive cocker spaniel suffering from a severe dehydrating bout of incontinence in a barbed wire cage with a blood-starred polar bear that just so happens to have a rage-inducing electroprobe permanently ensconced within its secondary love hole. The only answer to power armor is more power armor. <laughs> A lesson enthusiastically embraced by a certain small plastic toys manufacturer in the early 21st century, incidentally. <clears throat> Still, Koenig was no fool. She had not risen to the top of the Cartago sector for nothing and there were still potentially other ways and means to request reinforcements. After all, the Warders had seceded from the Imperium by putting weight on the traditional autonomy of Space Marine chapters from the overarching rule of Imperial governance. Surely there must be other chapters as well that holds a similar opinion and might move without the High Lord's blessing. To this aim, several communiques were dispatched to several different chapters to see what allies could be acquired. 
one of the first to receive a communique personally tailored to themselves as well, was one chapter that Cartago had had a previous relationship with, the Firehawks. They had, on many an occasion, based their expedition out of the Cartago sector, specifically the Sidon Ultra shipyards, which the Carthagans had allowed the chapter to use as a resupply and basing zone. This had created relatively firm ties between the two forces, and it most certainly did not hurt either that the Firehawks chapter master, Stibor Lazarek, had developed an intense dislike for Lufthuron during the Fourth Quadrant Rebellion, where he saw the Master of the Astral Claws as butting in on his own rightful glory. The Firehawks were a rather bellicose chapter at the best of times, and being offered an opportunity to settle a score, and with promises, of further hospitality and concessions on behalf of Cartago, they were all too happy to begin a quote-unquote investigation of lost Cartago shipping near the edges of the autonomous zone. In all due reality, this was a little more than legalistic ass-covering excuses rather than any truly honest rationale. But Tarnit Koenig were keeping her options open in case any external third-party Imperial agencies decided to have a look in on what was probably going to be a war zone awfully soon. And you would be amazed at the kind of lies one can get away with if one merely repeats them often and loudly enough. Currently patrolling in the Golgothan Wastes, the Firehawks began moving towards the northern borders of the Autonomous Zone. With their ships still scattered, they intended to gather somewhere within their area of operations, underestimating, fatally so, just how organized the warders were. One of the Firehawks' vessels a strike cruiser by the name of the Red Harbinger attempted a bit of a shortcut by cutting through the Endymion Cluster, the traditional stronghold and ancestral homeland of the Mantis Warriors, who were not about to let a strange and unknown strike cruiser pass through their domain unchallenged. What followed was an intense battle of wits and manoeuvres, as the Red Harbinger attempted to avoid the Mantis Warriors, who in turn attempted to close in on the Firehawks vessel and cut off its escape routes. It is certainly not easy to corner an Astartes strike cruiser, but the Mantis Warriors knew the area of space far better than the Firehawks, who were new arrivals, and slowly but surely the net began to close until, near the Galen system, the Red Harbinger had been surrounded by Mantis Warriors vessels, all with weapons fully powered and locked on to the Firehawks Chapter Strike Cruiser's engine block, ready and more than able to cut short any further attempts at flight. The Mantis Warriors further demanded that the Red Harbinger cut all its engines, power down its weapons, and also prepare to receive a boarding force of Mantis Warriors. The Firehawks responded that whilst the Mantis Warriors may very well be free to board one another's backside however much they please, no dirty secessionist dog would step a single foot on a Firehawk strike cruiser. It turns out that by some cosmic twist of fate, two of the most stubborn chapters in the entire Imperium were now staring each other down in a naval action. The Mantis Warriors had literally gone to the Endymion Cluster, one of the furthest reaches of Imperial space imaginable, precisely because they didn't play very well with others. And the Firehawks, well, they had been dispatched to the sector on the orders of their chapter master, Stibor Lazarek, 
who had sent them because he simply just really, really, really didn't like Lufturon. <laughs> Whose grand crime against the honour of the Firehawks was showing up and participating in a war that Stebor figured he could have won without help. This was not going to end well. After a short and increasingly ever more heated and hostile discussion, with both sides trading threats and insults, the Mantis Warriors finally ordered the Firehawks to halt immediately or be fired upon. To which I can only imagine the Firehawks responded, Try me, pleasure girl. <laughs> Instantly thereafter, their engines exploded. Having graduated from harsh words to yet harsher deeds, the Mantis Warriors then sent out strike crafts to begin boring through the hull of the Firehawk's vessel and initiate a boarding action. Once inside, they found the Firehawks still very much so uncooperative. It is unclear who fired the first lethal shots inside the hull of the Red Harbinger, and frankly, it did not matter much. A brutal, murderous battle erupted between the boarding Mantis Warriors and the defending Firehawks. Heavily outnumbered, the Firehawks nevertheless had the advantage of pre-prepared positions, turning every single corridor into a kill zone, hosing them down with bolter fire and deploying ready-made defences, heavy bolter servitors and las cannons to hold off the encroaching Mantis warriors, who in turn used their preferred style of rapid manoeuvres, hit and run attacks by cutting through bulkheads and blasting past barricades with a light assaults. The fighting must have lasted a fair few hours, because when it finally began to die down, with less than 20 Firehawks still alive and in Mantis Warrior captivity, not for any fault of their own, mind you, not a single one of them had surrendered, but the Astarte's body can take a truly comical amount of punishment, and even if the Mantis Warriors were not pulling their punches, which they probably were to some extent, then they would still almost inescapably be some prisoners. Those knocked out due to nearby explosions or blunt force trauma, or near mortally injured and sent into a restorative coma. These could then be gathered up by the Mantis Warriors and placed within hardened cells. Still, the Firehawks' resistance had not been entirely pointless, nor solely inspired by the fact that they are a legendarily bellicose chapter. They also had a tactical objective in mind. Protecting their resident astropath, who was dispatching a message to their chapter master, telling of their fate, how they had been detained by the Mantis warriors, fired upon, boarded, and murdered. As one may readily surmise, the Firehawks did not take the news well. Stebor flew into a maddened rage, lunging out at anyone and everyone and had to be physically restrained by his brothers. The news spread like wildfire throughout the entire chapter, and as soon as Stebor had calmed down enough to grasp a Voxcaster without shattering it, he immediately ordered for all chapter forces, every single ship, every single company, to gather and immediately set course for the Autonomous Zone. On the secessionist side, we can only begin to imagine what must have gone through the mind of Luft Huron and the senior commanders in the Warders' forces. A border war, little more than the occasional skirmish against Cartago, that was nothing. Even the planetary assaults were only to reclaim possessions that were already technically within the Autonomous Zone, and therefore, now, as far as Luft Huron was concerned, part of his own little mini-imperium. A war against a fellow Adeptus Astartes chapter? Oh, was something quite else, both in terms of lethality 
and potential ramifications. It was one thing to raid merchant shipping belonging to a sector on the fringes of Imperial society, quite another to get involved in open combat amongst Astartes. That was the kind of business that was bound to draw many unwelcome eyes to the Autonomous Zone. As for what Lufthuron himself thought about the Mantis Warriors' actions, we do not know, but publicly, at least, he stood behind their decision. And there wasn't, frankly, time for any more than that, as a Firehawks battle group crossed into the northern reaches of Lufthuron's little pocket empire mere weeks thereafter. Fortunately for the secessionists, the Firehawks' impatience had ensured that they had not gathered up sufficient forces to be a real threat just yet. Their intentions were probably to lash out as quickly as possible and damn the consequences. But when the Firehawks' mini armada, consisting of a battle barge and a couple of strike cruisers, ran into the combined forces of the Astral Claws and Mantis Warriors, even the famously pugnacious Firehawks thought twice before engaging in another bout of combat for which they were ill prepared. It also seems likely that Huron had placed a tight leash upon the expeditionary forces' commanders, because despite countless insults and threats being traded between the two forces, no combat occurred. Instead, the Astral Claws and the Mantis Warriors delivered the twenty surviving Firehawks over to the battle group, and in return, the Firehawks withdrew at least for the time being, though not for any reasons of reconciliation or friendship, mind you, but simply because they understood that fighting here would be unwise and would do little more than repeat the errors of the Red Harbinger. Instead, they would move out of the Autonomous Zone and await the arrival of their single most powerful weapon, the Raptorus Rex, a massive pre-Empire star fortress, capable not only of travelling through real space, but the Immaterium as well. The only other vessel in the entirety of the God Emperor's domain that could much and surpass the Raptorus Rex was the Phalanx of the Imperial Fists. It was a fleet in and of itself. And speaking of fleets, the Firehawks would soon receive fresh forces as well. Battlefleet Cartago had dispatched multiple of their own vessels and formations towards the northern borders of the Autonomous Zone, where they would join with the Firehawks and provide a solid base of security. Battlefleet Cartago would be the rear guards, ensuring that the warders could not sneak around or cut off the Firehawks' retreat, and they would also provide reinforcements and reserves if needed, whilst the Firehawks began to launch probing attacks into the Autonomous Zone to determine the scope of the enemy's defences. They had undoubtedly received briefings from Cartago's headquarters, but even though they were the neighbouring sector, hard good knowledge about the extent of the defences in the Autonomous Zone were difficult to come by, even more so now that it had become a truly independent zone. All they knew for sure was that it was very unlikely that the warders had simply sat by and acted passive whilst hoovering up all of the resources that would normally have flowed into Cartago sector. They would have used those to expand their own defences, although the only ones confirmed for absolute certain, via the unfortunate end of the Tithe fleet, was the Ring of Steel, with which the Tyrant had surrounded his capital system of Badab. This obviously precluded the normal Adeptus Astartes approach a clean, decapitating strike against the enemy's leadership structure. It would be very foolish to try to do so against the most heavily fortified system for several sectors in any direction. 
Instead, the Firehawks, using the Cartago battle fleet as rear security and screening forces, would strike deep first into the Endymion cluster to see whether or not it would be possible to slip through undetected by the Mantis warriors and perhaps harry their backwards lines and less defended worlds. The Firehawks were of course painfully aware that they were outnumbered 3 to 1, and whilst Kana Turnig reassured them that she had requested forces from other chapters as well, that was obviously no guarantee that any would actually show up. So the Firehawks intended to begin with dismantling the Mantis Warriors, beginning to strike at their vulnerable rearward areas, picking away worlds they held dear, or ambushing merchant shipping in the area, drawing the Mantis Warriors into small individual engagements where the Firehawks could fall upon them, outnumber them in a local area, and crush them. This, however, proved to be far easier said than done. The Mantis Warriors had been operating in the Endymion Cluster for centuries upon centuries upon centuries. They knew its every nook and cranny. They knew the precise location of every asteroid field that rendered sensorium equipment near worthless. They knew which areas were open and easily monitored. They knew the paths that might be chosen by an invader simply because they were the easiest. And they themselves also knew how to intercept those paths through strange and winding approaches that must have seemed impossible to anyone who did not have extensive and accurate charts of the areas. The Firehawks quickly found their advances checked again and again and again. They would think themselves in the clear, having just about managed to slip past the Mantis Warriors patrols, only to find twice their numbers of strike cruisers loitering in space in plain view just ahead of them. A clear indication that there was probably a lot more vessels nearby and hidden from sensors. The Firehawks, again having learned the lessons of the Red Harbinger, would then break off and try to find some other path, but this scenario simply repeated itself ad infinitum, until it had been made abundantly clear that there would be no sneaking through the Endymion Cluster for the Firehawks. If they wanted to engage the Mantis Warriors, it would have to be in a pitched void engagement. Moreover, it would also almost certainly be an engagement in which the Firehawks would be both outnumbered and outmaneuvered. Prospects in the Endymion Cluster were looking mighty grim indeed, to the point even that Steeboard ordered reconnaissance in force attempts to be made towards the Dab Primaris itself figuring that, perhaps, the scale of the defences had been exaggerated. This cheerful interpretation of reality would not stand up long to scrutiny, however, as the Firehawks reconnaissance parties could report that, if anything, the defences were even grander than initially reported. It would seem that the Warders had spent the last few months after the Red Harbinger in fevered activity, prepared for what was about to come. On the Firehawk side of the scenario, however, the Chapter Master Stevor Lazarek was starting to get a little bit desperate. The need to avenge the Red Harbinger was still foremost in his mind, and yet no matter where he turned, he didn't find any soft underbelly to strike at. Rather, he was faced at every turn with a parade of barbed wire hedgehogs, marching in perfect unison and wielding las cannons. The simple fact of the matter was that, whilst there was no shortage of potential targets, every single one of them with any real value was too heavily defended to risk it. Even if the Firehawks were able to come out on top in a local engagement, they would probably be so bruised and battered as to be unable to continue the campaign any further, which of course in turn meant that the secessionists would be the de facto victors. Even if the Firehawks managed to completely destroy one of the Warders' chapters in return for their own near annihilation, it was a three versus one fight, 
trading one for one wasn't going to cut it. And yet, something was going to have to be done, and soon. Frustration and anger was coming to a boiling point within the Firehawks chapter. And with Tarnit Koenig and her high lords breathing down Stebor Lazarek's neck, he was becoming ever more irritable and exasperated. Until finally, the reports came back with one potential suggested target. It wasn't valuable, it wasn't strategic, but it was relatively undefended, and it offered, at the very least, an opportunity for the Firehawks to vent their anger at their opponents. The scouting forces had identified an agri-world by the name of Iblis. Judging by the frequent shippings heading out of the system, it was a relatively significant food producer for the Autonomous Zone. Just how significant was unclear, but it would send a message into the Autonomous Zone that they were not safe. The Firehawks would not be denied, and they would take any target presented to them, no matter how petty it might seem. And the fact that Iblis was a soft target, a civilian world with nearly zero military value beyond its food shipments, the scale of which were as yet unknown, did not seem to overly bother the discontented Firehawks, who immediately set off in near full force along with Battlefleet Cartago elements to launch a massed assault upon the Agri-World. Time, however, was not on the Firehawks' side. The plannings for the campaign needed to be kept brief and simplistic out of necessity. The Mantis Warriors had demonstrated an infuriating talent to always be where they were least welcome by their opponents, and it would surely not take them long to realize that Iblis lay in a dangerously exposed position particularly as all other targets of interests had been exhausted. Quickly then, Stebor developed a simple, yet ruthlessly efficient plan. Expected to be able to batter apart any half-hearted parries thrown up by the Mantis Warriors. First and foremost, the spearhead would obviously consist of the Firehawks themselves, with a massed fleet formation and the mighty Raptorus Rex at the head of the flotilla. This should be a force more than sufficient to crash aside any resistance. But even the Raptorus Rex had its limits. Chief amongst them was its speed. The Rex was a behemoth of the void, a lumbering monstrosity that represented an undeniable, unresistible hammer blow to anything in front of it, but it could not turn quickly, it could not maneuver or react to rapidly changing circumstances. It needed an escort. And in void-faring terms, an escort is not merely a group formed up around the vessel. It needs to be a cordon stretching out for thousands of kilometers in every direction. And Stebo was very hesitant to commit his Firehawks vessels to this role. It would leave them dangerously scattered and overextended should the Mantis Warriors launch a rapid surprise assault something that they were most assuredly capable of. Indeed, it was practically their forte. Luckily, Stebor and the Firehawks had an ally that possessed just the kind of fleet that had specialized in escort missions for a very long time, and overjoyed that an opportunity to finally strike a telling blow against the warders Tarnith Koenig authorized a hitherto unprecedented scale deployment of Battlefleet Cartago's forces. Two entire fleets would provide the Firehawk Spearhead with all the screening and scouting it could ever possibly want. Such a large-scale deployment would push the capabilities of the Sagar Naval Yards to their absolute limits, and would leave them virtually completely bereft of ships. But as long as this could lead to a satisfyingly powerful blow being landed against the secessionists, it would all be worth it. 
It was vital for Carthagen morale that successful offensive action finally be taken, and there were other compelling reasons as well. The Lords of Carthago speculated that one of the premier reasons why the Imperium chose to not take an active hand in the conflict was that it figured the forces were evenly matched, and it would not risk the ire of neither the Warders nor Carthago when no clear winner was visible. But if Carthago could demonstrate sufficiently that they had a path to winning this conflict, then maybe Ancient Terror would intervene and end it prematurely, ensuring a favourable settlement for Carthago. An optimistic point of view undoubtedly, it was unlikely that the Warders would back down now, but not nevertheless an entirely unrealistic one. And Koenig had most thoroughly demonstrated that she was willing to place high stakes on slim chances. And even if the High Lords remained intransigent, the attack itself was still clearly worthwhile. It would land a blow against the Warders, it would increase morale, it would demoralise the Secessionists, particularly the Tyrant's Legions, and his civilian supporters who must have seen themselves as near invincible standing in the shadow of the mighty Adeptus Astartes. And it would also serve to keep the Firehawks placid. They had been straining hard at the leash Tarnit Koenig had so desperately attempted to place upon them ever since they entered into the war. Their undeniable strength was indispensable to the war effort, and yet Koenig was sorely aware of the real reason behind the conflict to begin with. The Carthagen sector was operating on borrowed time, the Assayer General was becoming ever more impatient, and the operation of Battlefleet Carthago and its deployment at this scale was ruinously expensive. It was crucial that she get her hands on the tithe still available to her as soon as possible, and the best way to do that was to deliver the secessionists a setback to present them with an unavoidable threat, a danger to which they had to respond. The Firehawks were supposed to be that threat, but up until now, they had only managed to shadow box with one third of the secessionist forces. Occupying the Mantis Warriors alone was not going to be enough to secure her trade lanes. But the calamitous burning of an entire secessionist world might just do it. That may just be enough to encourage the warders to fall back upon their own borders, at least temporarily. All she needed was a few months to launch expeditions into the autonomous zone and raid the depots which she knew exactly where was located. She had, after all, been the one responsible for drawing upon them in times past. Even a single one of these tithe storage areas would have as much of an abundance flowing within it as the entirety of the Sagar naval yards, and with such a treasure, she could both buy herself abundant time with the Assayer General, and also ensure the continued operation of Battlefleet Carthago for months and possibly years. All that was left then was to provide the Firehawks with the required aid for them to launch their own assault. Koenig would not be so rude as to refer to it as a diversion, but at least not within the earshot of any Firehawks, but if it coincidentally drew the secessionists away from the depots, well, that would be nothing more than a fortunate side effect. And surely, the unfortunate circumstances that saw her last gambit go so horribly wrong could not reoccur again, now could they? <laughs> For the answer to that question, you are going to have to wait until next week. Until then, I have been Arch, thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.